All right. I want to welcome everyone to the power of our story. Uh, we are a place of safety and connection for those who protect us, active duty and retired. And we do this through sharing stories in a healing and judgment-free zone. So if any of you would ever like to just join us on this virtual group, please uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn, Sarah Carell, or uh, thepowerofourstory.com. You can reach out to us there. Um, so today, I would like to introduce our guest, Patrick McCurdy. Patrick grew up in a family of servants to others. Patrick has served for over 32 and a half years in law enforcement. Over 28 of those years were served as a deputy and sergeant in the King County Sheriff's Office. Now that Patrick retired from the King County Sheriff's Office, he continues to serve others as a public safety advocate for first responder wellness and shift wellness and continues to help agencies build teams and care for their people where he teaches about viable resources and strategies that can help first responders or the first responders that you love to mitigate and deal with stress, grief, and heartache that all our first responders experience in the tough jobs they have dedicated their lives to serving others. You are not alone. And Patrick, um, I just want to welcome you. You know you are so loved by all of us on The Power of Our Story, and it's truly an honor to have this rich perspective that you are bringing for healing and for support for our protectors as your background and, and the work that you do in advocacy. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you. I, um, <clears throat> I love what you're doing here, Sarah, with The Power of Our Story, and uh, just a moment ago, I said this, but it is so incredible to be among such people that I have such respect for here today. And everyone on here has their own story that has inspired me. So I'm I'm very humbled by the opportunity. And I thank you. Um, like Sarah said, I grew up in a first responder family. And um, I had the opportunity, the blessing to become a first responder myself and spent the majority of my life doing that. Um, I did leave that last year and um, not necessarily on my own terms or by my own decision. And um, it was a, a difficult piece to leave uh, my identity behind. But I realized that um, God kind of on his chessboard of life shakes things up and moves you where he needs you, whether you like it or not. And that has been the story of my life repeated over and over again, being moved um, sometimes with protest from one location to another. And I am so fortunate, so blessed to be where I'm at right now. Um, Monica is here and she works at the same place I do for first responder wellness. I also work for the Counseling Team International and for Shift Wellness. And um, it is the best thing in the world to take care of people like you guys, um, first responders, that I love and respect so much. And I always felt as a police officer that um, every day I went to work, I felt like I made an impact. And I don't think there are a lot of jobs where people can say that. Let me correct that. I don't have a lot of experience doing other jobs because I grew up in this <laughs> and I can't imagine with some jobs when I walk around, I'll say sometimes, man, I can't imagine doing that. And I always give the person credit. It's never a negative statement because uh, clearly we need all of those people, all the people doing those jobs. And I'm a huge supporter and believer in the working person the blue collar workers, the people who put the grind in are members of the military uh, who serve in that capacity. But there are a lot of jobs that I can't see myself doing. And I've been blessed to have the time of my life doing the job that I love. But it doesn't come without cost or consequence. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story today. And um, I'm it's an honor to be here to do that. This is my um, contact information. And it's at the beginning of a lot of my shows, and I can share that with you later. I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook and easily reached there if people want to reach me or contact me, especially if you need help in your circumstances. And here is my first picture of me in uniform. <laughs> I um, 
I drew that at clearly a very, very early age. I didn't throw it together today for my presentation. <laughs> I think it says Pat on the bottom. And I'm guessing I was, I don't know, three, four, five years old. Um, you can ask anybody in my family. And from the time I was little, this, this is all I ever wanted to do. I mean, all I wanted to do was be a police officer. Um, I'll show you why. This here, um, this slide that you see, this is my mom and dad during the 60s. My dad was uh, on the left there. You see Oakland uniform, Oakland police officer, and he was in the riots during the 60s. A lot of um, Rich, who's here, Rich Oakley, his story resonates with me because a lot of it overlaps so much with what my dad did and saw. And a lot of the racial tension that he talks about was very prevalent then. Um, and my dad's partner, to this day, a great guy, was a black officer. And there were some interesting situations and ramifications and, man, amazing story. So I grew up hearing it all my life, all this stuff. This is the first time on Christmas Eve that I saw my dad in uniform, and you could just see the amazement in my eyes that that's my dad. Uh, this is when he uh, moved to the Hayward Police Department, and my mom, I didn't mention, was a deputy sheriff, excuse me, for Alameda County Sheriff's Department with her sheriff stories. Um, my uncle was a highway patrolman. Um, one thing I didn't mention that's a very... <laughs> Um, important part of my story is my mom grew up in Germany and her mother was a uh, also a first responder of sorts. She was a nurse. And by our estimate, I think my grandmother was a nurse well over 50 years because she did it first in Germany and then came to America. And a big part of our family story is how my grandmother as a nurse did what she could which wasn't necessarily much, but did what she could to resist the incoming influence of Hitler when he came into power. And um, she has stories about that that I'll share with you sometime if I have the opportunity. And then the Russians came in because they lived in East Germany. And so my mom lived under communism and under that um, oppression and fear. And that, that has influenced me a lot in a lot of ways. Uh, my mom in this current day and age has a lot of fear about the way the world is going and the things that are happening. And I think it's very relevant. Um, but it also put an indomitable sense of resistance into me and my blood. And I absolutely will not stand for a person harming another or um, doing something that's immoral or unethical. And honestly, that hasn't always gone well for me because when you stand up to those people, they do not like it because they tend to be tyrannical and mean people. And that's one of the things, truthfully, that led to my demise in the long run in law enforcement. And uh, But nonetheless, I have no regrets at this point. I think sometimes when we're in the midst of things, we have some regrets uh, because of the difficulty or the mud that we're trudging through. And um, I don't now. Uh, this is another picture of me wearing my dad's hat. And unfortunately, my little brother got cut out and the color's not very good. <laughs> you can see the awesome 70s color scheme that we have in the background. I see Leo could remember that vibe. <laughs> um, but, you know, this was a big part of my life. And I have a lot more pictures, obviously. Um, I didn't put one in here, but my first actual uniform I put on because I literally couldn't wait to put on a uniform and serve other people was a Cub Scout uniform. So I grew up in that. I became a Boy Scout later, and I couldn't wait to ditch the Boy Scouts because I wanted to do the real deal and become a goofy police explorer. <laughs> so there, uh, my brother and I are both police explorers. Um, I think I was a uh, explorer sergeant, and explorer means wannabe. It doesn't always mean gonna be. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time, and uh, I have some funny pictures of me with my baseball cap on backwards and the gun held up Charlie's Angel style, cl clearing a building, doing training and all that stuff. But um, my, this is where, at this time, when I was 15 years old, I experienced my, well, actually, let me go back. When I was 14, I experienced my first couple of um, major traumatic deaths. Um, there was one when I was a kid and one of my friends died of a heart attack when he was when we were six or seven. And that was unusual. I grew up in a pretty rough, violent area uh, in a suburb of Oakland called Hayward in California. And so uh, at 14, uh, one of the police explorers committed suicide. And it was um, when we look at it as adults with our 
backwards perspective, looking in the rearview mirror, it, it's sad because it was a girlfriend problem, which probably in a couple of years or a short period of time would be reserved, resolved. Within that same year, a second explorer committed suicide um, because he um, also had similar problems, but uh, the funeral that was given to the first one when the police officers came out and they draped the flag over his coffin and then police officers spoke on his behalf looked so glorious that I think that for some reason that poor 16 year old kid thought it was a good way to go out with that type of honor and committed suicide. And then I had other friends who weren't in that group commit suicide. Um, it's kind of surprising to look back and see how many, and because it was a rough area, I had friends who were um, shot or killed and who died by other means too. So that started very early. But when I was 15, I experienced my first line of duty death and a person, an officer, a police officer who worked for my dad, when my dad was a sergeant, who I knew. Uh, was murdered on the street that I live on, Broadmoor Avenue, about two, three blocks from my house and a block from the police department. He was stabbed at a domestic violence call. And I went to that funeral um, and those others that I mentioned. I also had a friend who was a captain in the Marine Corps and he was a helicopter pilot. And um, he, he uh, this was when I was 16, um, crashed in the San Francisco Bay and died in that with his other crew members. So uh, within a short period of time, it seemed like I experienced quite a bit of tragedy. And when I went to all these different funerals for my friend from the Marine Corps, and they had the honors and um, the honor guard was there. And when I went to the police funeral and saw all the police officers come out and participate in that, even my friend's funeral that I talked about who was an explorer, I came home to my dad and my dad was my um, hero in everything. And my dad said, I said, dad, I, I was so embarrassed. I was crying at the funeral. You know, I was in uniform. I was trying to stand there and my dad gave me the right advice, but I was a tough guy. Uh, so I didn't listen. My dad said, Pat, the true sign of a man is a man who could show his emotion regardless of circumstance. Um, but that wasn't what I heard. What I heard was suck it up, buttercup and don't cry. <laughs> he didn't say that. And my dad didn't model that. He uh, never hesitated to show emotion. And I saw him cry. But to me, that seemed out of sync with what I thought I was supposed to be. So I made this decision at a very early age, around 15, 16, that it was my obligation to show honor for these men and women who courageously went forward and served. And I decided I would go to every police funeral because that was my obligation. And I also thought my logic was that um, if in the gym or or working, I have a soft area, you know, on my hands or something, I'll develop a callus over time. And it's painful, but then that callus toughens up my hands. And I thought I could develop a callus on my heart and my soul to protect me from this embarrassment of crying and showing emotion. And those of you who have tried something like that or experienced death or loss at any level probably know that that's a dumb idea. <laughs> um, because going to those funerals doesn't create resistance or resilience in it. What it does is it creates more trauma over time. Because you see the pictures and the videos of these people who um, passed away. And even if you didn't know them, you feel like you do by the end of the funeral. And you, it's one more in your memory bank, one more uh, ghost that gets to come and visit you later during tough times. At 18, I achieved my dream. Look at that skinny kid. <laughs> it needs to work out a little bit more. I was trying at the time. I couldn't put on weight. My coaches were all saying, we'll lie about your weight and say you're 220. <laughs> Haven't weighed that much since for a long time. But uh, I, I got hired first as a police cadet in Newark, California, and then as a jailer in Hayward. And um, the trauma continued. One of my friends who was a police officer hired the same day I was, was murdered um, off duty, but doing a law enforcement task, trying to break up a fight in a bar in Oakland, California. And then um, of course the toll continues. There were others um, at 18 or 19. I became, I was acting as a supervisor in the jail and um, I experienced my first personal death where um, I had a person come in. We, I, I knew, I recognized it was an overdose. Um, he had swallowed a huge 
bag of drugs trying to hide it from the officers. And uh, I did CPR on him and it was uh, without, well, it was a bloody, messy, um, graphic way to die. And I remember kneeling down in his blood and vomit on the floor, doing CPR, trying to save this person going through this and yelling out. And I remember saying out loud, dear God, nobody deserves to die this way. And in the time that I worked in the jail, there were four more deaths. Um, I think I did CPR on all four of those. Maybe it was three of them and none of them made it. So uh, I'm not the guy to call if you need CPR. <laughs> I'm like maneuver. I can help you, but CPR, I'm not the guy. <laughs> um, but the um, tragedy never stopped. And from that point, as we know, once we go forward in life and once we experience tragedy, it's never going to go away and we carry it with us. It does get easier to deal with over time, but you stack more and more tragedies upon that. So this is, I like to joke, this is my life, thug life before being a police officer. Uh, as I worked in the jail, man, I had all these awesome opportunities. I got to be a part of the bicycle unit, a part of the Oakland Alameda County Gang Task Force. Um, this is me at a open house where I was training with the bicycle or where I stole a woman's purse from the crowd and ran the bicycles got to chase me down and tackle me and do a big show and play music and stuff. And then later that day, I put on the suit and got bit by a canine in a similar scenario where I was a bad guy. I got to do all that stuff. And I hadn't even reached my 21st birthday yet. It was a pretty good life. Um, at 21, I, I remember um, I would drive around and I'd see a police car go past with its lights on, or I'd see one of my buddies and I'd say, man, God, what I would give to do that. Um, my buddies would go out while I was working in the jail and they'd rack the rounds through the shotgun and turn on the lights. And you'd hear the laughter and the joking that's commonplace anywhere in a police station or a fire station. And we'd see that. And I, I would say it several times a day, God, what I would give to be a cop. And then I got my dream. In uh, 1993, I was hired at the age of 21, um, almost 22, to the King County Sheriff's Department. At the time, we were police officers and later became deputies because uh, things changed. And that's my little brother. He took my job as a jailer in the jail. He's wearing my badge with my badge number. And um, like I said, I was a King County deputy with that cheesy 90s mustache <laughs> that I wore for a long time. Um, shortly after I got hired there, uh, there were more tragedies, but I had a real fortunate circumstance. I witnessed a guy get hit by a car and, um, I won't tell the whole story now to leave a little cliffhanger, but one of the officers who came was this pretty redhead that I met. And, uh, there she is later. That was my, that is now my wife 25 years later, um, so I met her and she was on the job. Uh, it was kind of cool standing over this poor dead guy, DRT dead right there. <laughs> and we were standing over him and this pretty gal came up. And we shook hands right over him. And I was definitely not influenced by him, but by her, I was. Uh, I mentioned that my dad was my hero. You know, he was constantly um, getting awards and things. In 1977, he was police man of the year. And I remember that ceremony. It was, uh, we sat there in the uncomfortable suits that my mom sewed together for us. Um, police officers didn't make a lot of money. So I remember a lot of lean times growing up, um, but not bad times, all good with good memories. And you know, man, I was so proud of my dad and wanted so much to be like him. Uh, 20 years later, I had the honor of my first nomination at, for Police Officer of the Year, which we call Pooty, P-O-O-T-Y, Police Officer of the Year. So everybody jokes and they'll do announcements, shake your pooty. And uh, I had the honor of getting it 20 years after my dad. So kind of cool, a very cool memory for me. Um and I say this in no way out of conceit, but this built up who I was because um, I wanted to always remain consistent. And so again, in 2008, almost 10 years later, I was nominated again and selected for that. And then a couple of times as Sergeant, Sergeant of the Year. And um, I always felt like um, I wanted to emulate what my dad did and be like him. And uh, so... On some level, I, I it was an honor to be able to accomplish some of the small things that he did, or on a small level to accomplish what he did. 
this is a cool picture. I love this. This is the three sergeants, uh, my brother, my dad, and I. I think this was my promotion ceremony when I was promoted to sergeant myself. Uh, my brother's younger. He was promoted before me. And he is still in law enforcement. He's a deputy chief in a small area. Um, there's another picture of the three sergeants uh, at some other awards ceremony. I got to have my uh, dad and my mom and my brother pin badges on me at different times. So that was kind of cool. And my wife. But I just had this awesome career doing all kinds of things, teaching defensive tactics and being in a bicycle patrol unit and um, counterterrorism, um, undercover teams, task force groups. I got to do all kinds of stuff. And I am so blessed and fortunate. Um, I will say that I uh, threw out and you can see that I never Fired or uh, got to be a helicopter pilot because I simply do not fit. <laughs> in fact, uh, when I got in the back of the chopper, they said, we want to make sure we have enough ballast and adjusted their weight to make sure they could lift off with me of the chopper because <laughs> I'm such a petite little guy. Um, that was responding to an active shooter at a shopping mall and then just great times. But each one of these has a memory. Um, you know, the one on the far right is a uh, multiple casualty shooting incident with five people killed. Um, so as you go through this career, a lot of things happen. And there are a lot of things that you see, a lot of things that can't be changed. Um, the uh, tough part about this job is that people who wish to dedicate their lives to serving others, um, often people who come I was blessed with my childhood and with the opportunities I had and the parents and the circumstances. And I was blessed that I was somewhat shielded from the violence around me for a period of time until I grew a little bit older, but not everybody has that opportunity. And a lot of people come into this job because they are personally um, looking to resolve the issues or the things that happened to them when they were children. And I have the utmost respect for people who choose to do that because um, they they go into the storm despite all of their negative um, history, and they go in bravely and courageously to help other people. And I've always had respect for that. But what happens is um, no matter how good our intentions are, you begin getting exposed to things that no human should have to see. And one thing that I teach about on a regular basis and am involved in is we teach about the body's acute reactions to stress and post-traumatic stress injury. And when, for example, an average person is exposed to an adrenaline event where there's there are tons of chemicals released into your body, there's epinephrine and norepinephrine and dopamine, serotonin, cortisol, a lot of these are meant to help us through that event. They're called fight or flight chemicals by a lot of people. But what they also do too is uh, some of them are caustic if they stay in your body. And if you're exposed to adrenaline, it takes about 12 hours for that to leave your system. If you resume normal activity, begin breathing normally, et cetera. Well, thank God that police work is only about, uh, or fire department or being in the military is about one call that's adrenaline inducing at the beginning of your shift. And then you get to sit back and have your latte and write a nice report, not do anything for the next 12 hours. So you could go home refreshed, right? That's a lie. <laughs> it is not like that because you'll have three or four of those calls in an hour, sometimes every hour for a 10, 12 hour period. And so by the time we finish our shift in these first responder jobs and in military jobs, um, we don't, have the opportunity to resume normal operations, so to speak, to have our body return to homeostasis or balance before we go back to work again, because we don't have usually a 12 hour period between shifts. And so we're still in a hyper aroused adrenalized state when we return back to work. And so then the cycle begins again. And if you talk to a police officer, they'll tell you about the, or a firefighter, they'll talk about the first time they drove with lights and siren on and how um, it's a little bit of an overwhelming overload, even though you've ridden in the car and you you think you're acclimated to it, to drive that way the first time with all that noise, the siren over your head and everything is a little bit overwhelming because of the adrenaline. And the first time you go to a fight or a big call, there's a surge of adrenaline. And if you talk to an experienced officer, firefighter, first responder, they'll say, yeah, I don't feel it anymore. I just do what I have to do. 
and that's only partially true because it's it's similar to saying, um, yeah, coffee doesn't really affect me anymore. Well, it does, but you build tolerance to it and it takes more of it to affect you. So the adrenaline is still there. Your body still reacts to acute stress. It's just that we build this tolerance and we can tolerate more and more adrenaline. And frankly, for most of us, it becomes a way of life because we begin seeking adrenaline and trying to find that in our everyday activities. Um, a lot of the activities that we do, the sports that we're involved in, and sometimes, unfortunately, our addictions and our family life are influenced by that need for adrenaline. So um, if I, I have a friend who's a clinician, former firefighter, and when he sees a motorcycle shoot past at a high rate of speed with no helmet on, he says, yep, that guy just got back from his deployment overseas. Or if you um, see a bunch of guys joking around and doing stupid things on a speed boat in the water and jumping off into the water while the boat's flying along, you say, yep, a bunch of cops on their day off. Um, or firefighters. And so we seek that adrenaline because it becomes our normal way of coping with life. But what that means is that, and I have a chart for this that I didn't put here because I was. Uh, it took me a while to put the family photos together. I threw them together real quickly before we um, did this today. But what that means is that um, when we go up through this zone to uh, flood our bodies with the adrenaline we need to cope that coping mechanism to help us survive in a fight or flight circumstance, life and death, then we reach this top level. And there's a level of freeze that we don't talk about. And there is certainly, there are documented circumstances where a first responder or a person in the military actually froze and um, didn't perform their job. But that's not what we're talking about. Parts of your body will freeze. Certain brain functions will stop. If you try in an adrenalized state, and all you have to do is hop on a treadmill and get your heartbeat up to 145 beats per minute and now try to do a long division problem, you can't. Or even a simple task like basic motor movement, try to use your fingers on a calculator to work out that math problem that you can't do in your head because of the adrenalized state. So certain functions begin to freeze and shut down. Your digestive system will freeze. Um, because you don't want to be processing nutrients when you're in the middle of a fight or when you're running after a person chasing them into an alley. Um, other parts of your body will freeze. Cognitive function sometimes will freeze. And that's why after an event, if you think about, even if you're not in law enforcement, firefighting or in the military or something like that, an ER nurse or a dispatcher, even if you don't have one of those jobs, think about a time when you're driving on the freeway and a huge semi truck cuts you off and almost hits you. And so you jerk the steering wheel really hard, barely miss it and swerve off into the fog lane, catch your breath and then get back in, in the lane of travel. Well, some period of time, probably shortly afterwards, you'll start to shake and you'll say, oh, man, that was close because you have a surge of adrenaline and you have to go up through this fight or flight function shut down. And then you have to go back down through fight or flight to return to normal. So for us, going back down can be difficult because it means that we begin to process and see some of these horrible things that we've seen, like a, a child death investigation or um the loss of a partner in the line of duty, perhaps a violent circumstance, perhaps shots being fired, uh, doing first aid to a person who you know isn't going to make it, um, seeing a father identify his son who died in a car accident, having to notify a family about tragedy. And that's just a normal everyday thing in our lives. But it's it takes its toll. And what I see on this end of the spectrum doing what I do now is I see people who come to me and say, yeah, it was that one event. And I politely smile and nod and say, yeah, man, that would do it. I agree with you. But we know that it's not one event. And I talk about this a lot. And this is not my um, thing that I came up with. This is kind of an industry um, uh, story that we tell. And it's, I wish I could give credit to the person who first coined it. But as we go through life, we have this backpack we're issued. And the backpack is empty when we get it as a little baby. But we start collecting these unique items and we see them and we say, wow, look at that rock. And we start putting rocks in our backpack. And some are great big, heavy rocks, jagged and difficult and painful to carry. And as we go through this over time, uh, these rocks begin to bear down on us. At first, it strengthens us. Uh, going through 
difficulty in life, going through um, difficult circumstances and suffering through those things can build resilience and it can build toughness and it can build all kinds of positive things within us once we endure and make it to the end. And every person here has that story and they're a testament to that. And it's been an honor to hear all of you sharing your stories. But sometimes there's one rock too many. Or in the case of a first responder, maybe five or 10 years of loading those rocks up in that backpack till it cripples you. Because most first, first responders don't come forward when they first see the signs of trouble. We push to a point where no other person does because that's what we were taught to do. If you hear me speak, I say this a lot in the different formats and contexts where I speak and with different um, teaching that teachings that I do. My dad used to say, there are four people you'd ever talk to, kid. First one is a politician. Second one, the media. The third, an attorney, and never talk to a damn shrink. <laughs> I think he was right. <laughs> he was right about all of them, uh, but the shrink. And my dad, um, unfortunately, in 2013, passed away from early onset, acute stress-induced Alzheimer's. And I wonder if the attitude was different when my dad started this stuff. He served in the military too, by the way, before he was a police officer. But I wonder if he would be here today or if he would have managed that better. And even though now I surround, I'm surrounded by people who are doctors and clinicians and therapists and counselors on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I laugh and say, what would my dad think? All these damn shrieks around me all the time. Uh, but even though that's the case, I didn't take care of myself because, and I still truthfully, even though I know how good these people are and how good their heart and their intention is, I still in the back of my mind have a bit of guilt because of what my dad told me where he said, never talk to a damn shrink. Now, when I don't talk to politicians, the media or attorneys, I have no guilt whatsoever for some reason. <laughs> but um, with clinicians, it has to be a part of our life. So these are just a couple pictures from the last couple of years. Actually, I should have put one in here because um, I have one with Brian who joined us today at a different conference. But uh, this is a little bit of a glimpse into what I do now. So I took the um, – and did you guys see the show end? Did it end for you? Or am I still sharing my screen? Oh, no, I'm still sharing. Okay. Yeah, you're still sharing. Oh, there you go. So here is um, the short version, the nutshell of what I've been talking about. If you're not a first responder, the same thing happens. But as a first responder, we become accustomed to acute stress. And acute stress, if not treated, becomes post-traumatic stress. Now, post-traumatic stress can become an injury too. We used to call it a uh, disorder. If I have a disorder, or if I tell you you have a disorder, it means there's something wrong with you. And if I tell you that you have an injury, that's different. If I tell a police officer, a firefighter, a Marine, a, a guy in the Army, you name it, a nurse, a dispatcher, you have a disorder, they say, well, nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to push through. But if I tell you you have an injury, they're going to say, you're not keeping me down with an injury. And I always use the comparison in a physical context of when in the bicycle unit, I crashed my bike and my buddy crashed in. Actually, he crashed into me. He saw a pretty girl. I saw a homicide suspect and I hit my brakes. He didn't. So we both went over the handlebars and crashed. I dislocated my shoulder and I was a tough guy, badass. So I pushed through and for 18 months with a dislocated shoulder, I kept working. Now, if you uh, worked in law enforcement, there are a lot of you here, or if you were a firefighter or, or in the military or whatever, um, if you know that your partner is riding a bicycle every day, his gun hand, his right hand has a dislocated shoulder that in certain positions causes him excruciating pain that could drop him. Was I fit for duty in that context? Nope. Uh, I was unsafe. I managed to make it work. I even competed in a huge charity boxing event with a dislocated shoulder because I'm a tough guy, right? But that's not smart. It's like my idea that I told you about earlier, where I'm just going to go to all the funerals and become a tougher guy and toughen up and build a callus. It doesn't work that way. Your mind and your body break down at a certain point. And that's what happened to me. I had to have surgery, complete re reconstructive surgery to fix my shoulder. Well, there was no shame in me saying that I 
had it fixed and I saw a specialist. And then when I had to do physical therapy afterwards, I could brag about it. And I could say, yeah, I can't come back to work yet. My therapist is still kicking my butt and uh, I'm going to be there for a while. But why is the brain different? I can show you pictures that show through brain scans that a person who has post-traumatic stress has an injury to their brain where it functions differently. And the parts of the brain, the amygdala, which is uh, called, or excuse me, which is the Greek word for almond, and it's the size of an almond when not inflamed, but with a person who's experienced post-traumatic stress will become inflamed to the size of a shelled walnut. That's a huge difference. And it's constantly white hot and firing rapidly. So we now know that this injury that we used to say nobody can see is actually something you can see, and it's an actual viable injury. And we know that's not a disorder because we know we can fix it. So just like my shoulder, my surgeon told me, you will never do push-ups and pull-ups again. Watch me every day to this day, many years later, I do push-ups and pull-ups just to prove him wrong. You don't tell me I can't do something. Remember that that's a big part of my life my uh, mom growing up under the Russians and, and the communist reign and all of that that happened, you don't tell me I can't do something. So if we take that attitude with our first responders and our people in the military, and we treat it as an injury, which it has been labeled as since 2012 in the Amer American Journal of Psychology. So if this is the accepted label, think about the power that we have in that. But let's also think about the power for um, personal coverage, because insurance, if they can show root of origin in your childhood and say that this injury started when you were a child because of the horrible things that happened, and then they say uh, it's a disorder, something that is wrong with you, you may not be covered. But if it's an injury, I can show you that it happened on the job. And when we hire cops and firefighters, uh, we don't hire a guy who's on his third marriage a uh, third broken marriage, who's got a gambling addiction, addicted to porn, drinking way too much, and taking those pain pills from a few years ago that he shouldn't be taking. We don't hire that guy. We hire Captain America, Wonder Woman, these superheroes that come in. So if that's not the person we hire, we hire a completely different person. Why do so many end up that way in the end? There's only one common denominator, the job. So I just got emotional saying that. Because I have so many friends that have the same attitude I did. They're all tough guys, badasses, and they're pushing through. And I get calls on a regular basis now. People that I know and I care about crying and saying, I can't do it anymore. I'm hurting. And uh, I say, there's a solution. We can fix this. And they say, no, I'm good. I talked to you, so I'm good. And they keep pushing through. Same thing I did. Same thing a lot of people here did. And uh, there's a solution. We can fix that injury so it no longer is prevalent. And it doesn't mean that you'll lose your ability to your awareness and your ability to function on the job. It means you'll be better. And it also means that when you're going back down through that zone and you hit fight or flight again, because we as first responders don't show symptoms the same way other people do because we push it down and we're masters because when you're in a, a violent domestic violence call and the husband and the wife are screaming at each other, you can't show emotion. When you're delivering news about a dead kid to their family, you can't show emotion. You stuff it down. Uh, when you're dealing with a bad boss who is a tyrant and, and, um, should never have been in that job. They're dishonest. They should never have been in that job in the first place. You don't show emotion. You show your tough guy side because that's the easy, acceptable one. And I did that well. Um, they joked about McCurdy coming in to tip over the tables. <laughs> Though I never actually tipped the table over on my sheriff. I was close. <laughs> and uh, um, I stood up to that. But when you go home and you let down your guard and you start to come back down again through that same fight or flight mode, Unfortunately, what happens is your family gets the brunt of it. Mine did. You know, for me to be angry at my uh, beautiful baby daughter who's crying, because that's what babies do, is totally inappropriate. But that's what happens. And so life here on this side is so much better because now that I left the job, I did have regrets in the beginning and it was a difficult transition. Um, and, uh, you know, James, when you, 
or anybody, if somebody here decides that you're ready to take that step, give me a call. We'll talk a little bit about it because my whole identity was caught up in that. And I didn't realize how much of it, but everything. But I realized that I still have that. I still have the stories and the cool pictures and the awards on my wall, but there's so much more to me and to life than that piece. And I'm so much better being humbled by that and cut down. Uh, I lost, I was stripped of my pride, um, which I didn't want to go through. I wanted to be that big, badass, tough guy still, but I don't have to be anymore because now I can be vulnerable and real and I can count among my friends People like you who are also vulnerable and real. So um, there, in a nutshell, is a um, a long time with a lot of excitement and fun and a lot of difficulty, too. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Patrick, thank you so much. Wow. I, I knew it would be a very rich presentation, and it was great to hear about your background um, I, I think uh, one thing that I thought was so cool is as I hear so many stories, it, it's there's there's many parallels like what your grandmother did and her strength and how now coming to this country um, and what that produced in you and your brother um, to be protectors. Um, and then I just appreciate you being very real about the challenges of being a protector and how all that works with post-traumatic stress or acute stress. And if it's not um, dealt with, that it can turn into post-traumatic stress injury. So um, Patrick, I want to thank you so much. And I just, I just want to open it up to everybody else uh, to ask a question or comment. So Barry, thank oh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Go ahead, Barry. You know, Patrick, um, I wouldn't know where to begin with it. That is the most profound and moving presentation I think I've ever heard. I mean, I could quite happily take this recording um, and send it to every veteran I've sat with and step back and, and, re and retire. Um, yeah. I mean, your father's story is, we're a similar genera generation. I grew up in war, the apartheid in South Africa, um, taking many trips through Israel, through the concentration camps and seeing the horrors there. But hell, Patrick, um, that encapsulates everything. And and you are right. You should not talk to a shrink unless they're fully informed by the body. And, and to finally be in the presence of somebody who can word it so beautifully from the body, who combines your experience and your life experiences in a language that's not just neuroscience-based, but the backpack on your back with the rocks is, is, is just, you nailed every single aspect of healing. It was moving, it was profound, and, and I really want to thank you. That, that just to be in the presence of who you are and what you said, um, it's just awesome, absolutely awesome. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. I'll share with you a photo that my, or excuse me, um, a screenshot of something my daughter drew for me. And um, this is what I show when I talk about the backpack full of rocks. And I actually show it in stages as the person begins to succumb to that. Um, so, um, but I think the one thing I would do differently if I were to have her commission her to do artwork for me again, is I'd have her start with a child holding that empty backpack full of hope and expectation. Um, and I think one of the things about this that's difficult is that these aren't loads that we choose always to bear. Um, there are definitely loads that we take on. We know with the job, there's going to be a load, but some of these things aren't things we choose. So thank you, Barry. I'm very moved by that. You guys are going to make me keep wiping tears. <laughs> Jim, go ahead. And I see your hand, Rich. Um, I'll get to you. I see Jim and Leo have their hands up too. So Patrick, you know, you talked about the child, uh, you just said that the hope and expectations at the beginning of the picture. Um, but you also talked in your presentation about your time as an explorer scout. Um, and so that's what I want to kind of piggyback on because I too, you know, at age 14, you know, started in that program um, and, you know, went through my first traumatic events um, at that very young age. Um, you know, I was right there with 
everybody else that was on that crew that was, you know, dealing with whatever trauma was, et cetera. But I had no idea. Um, you know, frankly, initially it was like, hey, that's cool. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, you're a young kid. Um, and I think, I think we're doing a disservice um, in our professions, bringing those, those young children into our environment um, and not, um, not being prepared to address their trauma issues uh, that result from that. Um, and I think, you know, you talk about the, the guy, that, the one that committed suicide or whatever, right? I mean, who, who knows what all the circumstances were, but, but, you know, potentially some of that trauma that, you know, or, or that exposure that they were getting in the workplace uh, or in the, the profession there, um, they just weren't ready for it. Right. Um, and I don't think that, you know, I was a fire chief. Uh, I had a, I had lots of kids running around my department, you know, as Explorer Scouts was never really on my mind. Um, it wasn't until I retired and I started telling my story and I started going back through my pictures that it was like, Hey, this was probably the beginning, you know, uh, because those, those ghosts or those events, you know, still pop up fresh as can be. And so I think, I think that's just something that, that we need to be aware of and, and people need to address. And, and I do think that, that um, a lot of our younger people that, that take that path into our professions, even the military, you know, um, you know, where they bring them in, you know, pretty young and, and that type of thing. So, um, and then the, the aspect of retirement, um, uh, because I know James mentioned it and, and you kind of talked about it. And, you know, I really think it comes down to purpose and passion, you, you know, uh, for me, that was, that was the key. Um, my purpose, um, wasn't being fulfilled, um, at that time in my career, you know, it was, it was, uh, um, you know, what I believed in and, you know, the challenges that were being put in front of me, the roadblocks that were being put in front of me for sort of achieving my purpose, um, really kind of took its toll. And then the passion, um, for the job, the passion that I had when I was 14 years old, um, and continued for the next 45 years, um, was gone. And so, you know, that was kind of the, the opening to me to recognize that, okay, this is, this is time to move on. Mm. I, I really appreciate that, Jim. You said a couple things. One thing, um, when I was an explorer and that happened, what I didn't mention is they handled it correctly. Um, we had to go through, I think it was like 40 hours of intensive suicide awareness training. And uh, at, as a 15, 16 year old kid, that was pretty intense, but it really prepared me and framed it for me for later because when I deal a lot with people who are um, on the cusp of suicide, and they're talking about that as a, the only option or a very real option. And for me, because of what I experienced and what I learned about it, that was never an option. And so at my worst moments, when I was sitting in a patrol car in an alley by myself, sometimes openly weeping, um, trying to deal with the circumstances, especially the betrayal and the administrative betrayal, um, that was never a place that I went because of what I experienced, the loss portion, seeing how profoundly and difficult that was how profoundly and difficult uh that was for me to experience the grief but also going through and learning the mechanism and so that training that i got as a police explorer stayed with me throughout my career and i still use to this day interacting with people who are suicidal asking the right questions and making sure that i can help them um and that has evolved to a point where i now teach at the police academy um recruits coming in about uh, this stuff. And I talk about how important it is to see a, a shrink, the damn shrink. And I talk about that, normalize it. And Barry's right. It should be a culturally competent person who knows how to deal with it. Um, also a person who can, because, you know, with different religious affiliation and belief systems and background, we have to find the right fit. It's like, I always tell people like buying a car, you never walk on the lot and say, uh, I want that one. Now you have to test drive it and make sure it works. So now I have the honor of teaching um, incoming recruits for my former agency, King County, um, incoming recruits for the state, 
and then also experienced officers at different levels. And I get to teach there and chaplains about these things to normalize seeking help, suicide awareness, and um, taking care of yourself cognitively as well and emotionally as well as uh, physically. So that's the evolution of that. And, and I think it's a work in progress that has to keep going. And then you talked about passion. And the funny thing is at the end, I was so beaten down by circumstances and betrayal and dishonesty and corruption that I didn't have the passion that I started with, but I'd still get in my car and say, God, I love this job. Like I always had, because in that, that was my safe place where I felt good. Um, I'm so blessed because I have a friend who's um, in his late sixties and he's now retiring and it breaks my heart because I'm seeing what I ho I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's the stress of the job, but I'm seeing some things that I saw with my dad when he started losing his memory. And I hope he didn't wait too long to pull the plug, but that would have been me. I would have waited too long um, because I had this number in mind, you know, my dad did like 42 years and I said, I've got to do at least that. 32 years is no joke, but to me, it wasn't enough. And it never would be because if I hit the 40 year mark, I'd be saying, well, I need to do five more or maybe 10. If I could hit 50. And the truth is that um, I, I would have run myself into the grave too. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I see I, the. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, unfortunately for me and in, in, you know, that would have been great to have that for us kids back then. Yeah. But in the late seventies, we still weren't, we still weren't there as a profession, um, you know, looking at that kind of stuff or, or talking about that stuff. And Sarah, could you pause for just a minute? Yep. Um, as oh, I, yeah. I see, whoops, excuse me. You can't hear me. Yeah, I got you. Sorry. That was oh, me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Patrick, I want to no thank problem. you for your, I want to thank you for your share. There's a certain gentleness to your power. You know, and uh, that's <clears throat> that's not something that we learn in books, you know. Uh, you know, you mentioned flight or fight, fight or flight. Mine was finish it, finish it. And I'm not a tough guy at all. I lost almost all my fights. And I found um, a few times near the end, I was weeping when I was done. Like, what the hell is that? What the hell is that? Well, I thought, you know, get people at work, image, la, la, la. So I talked to my site. And he said to me, uh, uh, that's your body. That's the only way it knows how to get rid of rage is through your tea is through your tears. You know, um, we don't retire. Well, they don't teach us how to retire. Well, either, you know, we're in that uniform and all of a sudden our 40% of our, of our social life is gone and our identity has gone for a lot of us. So now we're alone and we got to deal with our stuff. And, you know, PTSI is a real thing. 40 years of booze and pills and stinking thinking, anxiety, depression, that shit happens to affect and accumulate over time. And you want to know why we don't retire well is now you've taken everything away. I've got nothing left but my booze and, 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 and away, you know, they, they don't address it as much as they should. And uh, uh, I learned this week, one more thing about I took a I was on a neuroscience webinar. I'm not a scientist or none of that stuff. But the, the the scientist she made a really good statement, and I want to share it with the group. The part of the brain that has empathy is also the part of the brain that stores vicarious trauma. I'll leave that with you, scientists. Patrick, honor to hear you, man. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, brother. It's uh, an honor to have you here too. Um, one thing, Leo, I talked about the evolution with um, Jim about how I was an explorer and went through that training and now get to teach young officers and sometimes explorers, but I'm also teaching retire well classes. And um, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of shake those guys in uniform who, and men and women in uniform who are coming up on that or perhaps are already in it. And like you said, that thought keeps replaying in their mind or all of a sudden they have this free time, don't know what to do with it. Uh, my friend, man, the sweetest guy ever, he's a firefighter and he tells his story about how um, he wanted to go back to the fire station. He's got all dressed up. His wife said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to go see the guys, honey. She said, is that a good idea? He said, oh yeah. So to surprise them, he showed up to have lunch and he walked in and couldn't get in. He pulled out his card and it bonked him, wouldn't let him in. 
So finally, the lady buzzed the door and he walked in and she said, hi, who are you? And it's a new lady at the reception desk. And he said, oh, well, I'm Bob. You know, I'm Bob. She said, okay, and what do you need? So she got him a visitor tag and called the captain. And the captain he least wanted to see came out and said, oh, hey, what's up, Bob? What are you here for? He said, well, I just wanted to see the guys for lunch. He said, well, there are a lot of guys here. Do you want to come in? So he went in, and one guy was cleaning the truck, and a couple guys were there. And they said, oh, hey, Bob. He didn't get the cheers welcome. You know, Bob, everybody in unison. And, you know, just heart-wrenching for him, this sweet guy. And it breaks my heart when he tells the story. But that's retirement on a lot of levels because – you know, you call your buddy, you say, hey, when are we going to link up for lunch? Because now you have this free time and you aren't encumbered by stress all the time. And they are, they're in the middle of it. They're in their stress. They're still doing the job. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, let's get together. And two months later, they don't. But that was me. That was me doing that. So uh, that's what I teach. I teach there. You've had the whole class. You don't need to go. <laughs> but thank you, brother. Uh, Catherine, I see your hand, but I think Rich had his up before yours. Do you mind if I go to him real quickly? Go ahead, Rich. Uh, Patrick, uh, man, I love you, brother. <laughs> love it. Um, Jim, I hope someday I get a chance to hug you, man. But uh, I have some questions back, but thank you very much, man. I wish I had known you many years back, but anyway, <laughs> the neckties that you guys had on, were they pull-offs? Yeah, yeah, good, good. breakaway, yeah. I know when they gave me mine, I said, what do you mean, clip-on? He said, yeah, if somebody grabs you, they're gonna be fooled, right? So I said, oh, that makes sense. But the other thing, uh, you were, when you were talking about the, the trauma that we, uh, we absorb, also the smells. I worked in homicide for a while. And to this day, every once in a while, it, like if I ride past a, a carcass of a dead animal, it brings back that stuff to me, you know, because uh, decomposition, when, once you smell that or fresh blood, you never forget it. It's there, right? Um, then, um, uh, when I went into therapy, uh, the therapist said to me, she said, you know one of your problems? I said, no, you are an adrenaline junkie, right? She said, that's why you did all this crazy stuff undercover because you you loved it. You liked it. It you fed it. It fed you. And I said, wow. Um, Retirement, um, like so many other guys, I didn't go out on the best best of uh, circumstances. Uh, the same year I went out, uh, I lost my I lost my youngest brother, and uh, my mom wasn't taking it well, and that's when all the the uh, we call them the suits in DEA, you know, the people that. Many of them never been on the street, don't know what the hell's going on, but but they think they know more about what you need to do in your life than you know what I mean. Um, and the other thing that got me too that I knew something was wrong is when I'm at the, I'm at a family funeral and I'm not, I'm the only person that's not crying. You know, I said, "What's wrong with me?" Right. But anyway, I love you, brother. I love you too, man. I would have loved to saddle up with you and ride, <laughs> especially when you had that awesome Afro you showed us. <laughs> when I had my long hair and beard, we would have been a hell of a pair. <laughs> uh, you know, truthfully too, I mean, um, one thing, Rich, is that I think we're afraid of losing that warrior piece of us when we leave. But the truth is that that never goes away. And I know if we were all sitting around today in person, which I would love, around a coffee table, and we heard shots being fired, or like you said, we smelled a smell, every one of us would spring into action. And it'd be an honor to roll out with you guys by my side mm -hmm. um, to deal with whatever came. 
And uh, so that never goes away. But I think that's a fear that we have is losing that that tough, rough edge of, a, of, of us. But like I said, I, um, I've been wearing a mask my whole life about what a tough guy I was. And now that I am not pretending to be the grizzly bear, being the true teddy bear <laughs> is so much more fulfilling. But I could snap into the grizzly roll if I need to. And I know you could too. The other thing that happens, I, like I could be watching a movie and a gunshot goes off it, and I jump, you know, it, it's crazy. Yeah. I, uh, you said that you didn't cry at a funeral and I definitely could relate to the numbness being numb is healthy for us. We think, but um, my daughter has to babysit me when I watch a Disney movie, cause I'll be bawling. <laughs> and I hate it. She leads in. Are you crying yet, dad? No, no, I'm, I'm angry. <laughs> so thank you rich i love you too brother Catherine. um so i needed the extra minutes to collect myself anyway but um that i found that 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 was captivating so thank you for sharing um one as as a civilian i really appreciated your caffeine analogy i feel like it made things make sense for me as someone who's never been in the situations that you guys have been in. Um, but I do drink too much caffeine. So I feel like I can kind of understand a little bit. Um, and Patrick, as you're the son of police officers and also the father of your children, and you are a police officer. So I feel like I could ask you like a bazillion questions. Um, but I, I, we'll keep it short. I did have one quick question. Um, when you were crying to your dad and he said what he said, but you sort of perceived it differently, you perceived it as suck it up buttercup. Um, do you have any thoughts as to maybe why you kind of perceived it that way? Do you think it's because you were surrounded by the people you were surrounded by or what are your thoughts? Um, we definitely need to schedule some time to do those bazillion <laughs> questions. I think we could talk a long time. Okay, I, I do have thoughts. Uh, the first thing is that he didn't say what I wanted to hear. And I think in, in any conversation, we tend to do that. We we don't listen well. We elicit what we want to hear. And sometimes with a very um, a confirmation bias, you know, when I went to my dad, what I wanted him to say was, here's how you stop crying, kid. You know, you, you bite your cheek really hard or something like that. And I tried that. That doesn't work. <laughs> but... Um, so that's part of it was I went in with a confirmation bias and he didn't say what I wanted to hear. And I thought it didn't sound tough enough or badass enough. And that's my dad. You know, I can't believe my dad who's an Oakland cop would cry at a funeral. And so I came in that way. But the other thing is um, I misaligned or inappropriately chose my role models early on too. Um, because I, I, you know, to me, um, I have told the story before and uh, when I was seven and my dad, my son, excuse me, not my son, my brother was five. My dad uh, took us to a SWAT training and um, they rescued us from my dad and we were pulled off the side of the building. I mean, and you wonder why I do what I do. I, I was with my dad in San Francisco on Pier 39 when he caught a shoplifter. And then I was with him when he caught a shoplifter at Safeway. It was so fun because the guy came running out, this scraggly guy with an army coat stuffed with meat packs he stole. And my dad arced him up and threw him, boom, in a flower pot. Dirt went everywhere. And he's screaming. And my dad said, give me your other arm. And the guy said, you're going to break my arm. And my dad said, you're right. Now give me the other arm. <laughs> so that was my uh, modeling that I thought my dad was. And my dad said something about when you make an arrest, you won't ever see justice. So the only justice is at the time of the arrest. Well, I thought that meant like you get your licks in when you can. And luckily I didn't try that, but I thought that's what it meant. But what he meant was you take that person, like if it's a DUI, you book them into jail that night. You don't write them a citation and let them go because they'll never spend another day in jail because the courts don't work in your favor. They let them go. So my first role models in law enforcement, I, I, one of them was this guy and he did everything I wanted to do. He was on the SWAT team. He taught defensive tactics, all that stuff. But he was brutal. And um, I saw his interactions and I started to you know, question, is this really what I wanted to do? I mean, he, he was out of line, inappropriate. Uh, I saw him just 
exert for force and authority inappropriately over people. And I thought, you know, because he taught me too, I thought, well, that's how it has to be. You know, I have to be this guy. And he said, in a jail, you never take a minute of slack from anybody because you'll never live it down. It'll be your reputation for the rest of your life that you're soft. And so I was trying to emulate what I thought I was supposed to. And two things happened. The first thing was I went to a restaurant with a girlfriend I had at the time, and I saw him off duty with his wife and kids. And his kids were off the hook. They knocked over the gumball machine and broke it, gumballs everywhere, broken glass. They were screaming and running. And he didn't have any control in that. And I saw him get in a fight in the lobby with his wife and they're screaming, yelling in the lobby of a Mexican restaurant. And then they left. And so I started to question, is this really the guy that I want to model myself after? Because, you know, all this exerting control is overcompensation for a lack of complete control, lack, complete lack of control in his personal life. And then at work, a guy was banging on the jail door, which they all do, and yelling. And I went down there. I said, what do you want? He said, man, I just want a meal. I said, shut up and sit down. And I turned around, walked away, and I stopped. I said, I am so embarrassed. That is not me. So I turned around, went back. I said, what do you need, man? He said, I'm just hungry. I said, I'm sorry. I'll be back. And I went and I got him a meal, heated it up, brought it back. And I was so ashamed of those moments where I acted like that. So luckily, my what my dad said later resonated with me. And then my own experience trying to be that tough guy that I wasn't resonated. But it was just, like I said, confirmation bias going in seeking something. And then also, I had the wrong role models at the time emulating what I thought police work was. And that's not what it is at all. Long answer. Sorry. I have a follow up question, if you don't mind. Sure. As since your dad was, you know, a different generation, probably of the suck it up buttercup generation, why do you think he sort of had the wherewithal to guide you in such a way that kind of gave you permission to be sensitive when you needed to be? I think for the same reasons. Um, I told you about his partner. His partner had this classic, it sounds like a crime novel, Booker Ely, awesome name. And uh, the stories of them rolling the streets together and um, <laughs> Rich, my dad's partner, I said he was black and uh, my dad told all the stories. But one time they're at a burglary alarm at a warehouse and they're sneaking around the corner and inside the warehouse, a huge dog. My dad said, must have been a 150 pound Rottweiler. Hits the inside of the door. Rawr, 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 rawr. And his partner Booker said, oh, Lord, I hope we don't like dark meat. <laughs> So my dad had a lot of those uh, bad stereotypes that I had, or excuse me, not stereotypes, role models that I had too, and realized he wasn't that way. And my dad was an incredibly kind and insightful man. If he hadn't been a police officer, he was uh, in training to become a minister. And um, he always had that side. And he knew that that was what was in me too, and did a really good job throughout the years of bringing it out. I wish he was here today to see this, but just to bounce things off of him and say, dad, you know, I mean, this is pretty weird in the world. Is it stuff you saw? And so uh, I think that's why. Yeah, that's nice. And then um, for the retirement story and the retirement piece that um, some of you other guys talked about, um, the I, I think you've told the Bob story in the past because it reminded me of recently, my dad had to go and get a, um, a new ID. And so he went down to the, to the department where he needed to do that. And nobody knew who he was. Nobody recognized him or had any idea why he was there. Um, but it didn't impact him the way it maybe could have because all his career was a, a big piece was holding on to his identity beyond, you know, his uniform, but beyond being a cop. And I think that that really saved him in not only that moment, but in, in his retirement that he, he was always more than, than a cop. So I just wanted to share that too. We're all just grains of sand in an hourglass of time, you know, and as our sand passes through that hourglass, others follow us. And, um, you know, I know that there are people I made an impact on and with, and, uh, I, that resonates with me. Um, at some point, I'll tell you a really cool story. One of the children growing up in the neighborhood I patrolled, um, I recently connected with her on Facebook, and it was so cool uh, to do that and to hear her say, oh, man, I remember you as Officer McCurdy. We all remember you. And 
uh, I've had a few experiences like that. And so um, I don't need to seek that anymore. I think that's part of um, being stripped of my pride. That's a good thing. Um, and humility I've talked about here before is different from being humble or humbleness. Humbleness is not being um, audacious in thought or opinion uh, and, or not having a high opinion of yourself, but humility is being stripped through, excuse me, through hu ha uh, having humility means experiencing humility and being humiliated. And um, a lot of us, <laughs> I'm one, need that sometimes. So your dad, as much as you've spoken about him, I have a lot, of, I've never had the opportunity to meet him, but I have a lot of respect for him because he sounds like a very humble and kind person as well. And that's why he's able to do that. Thank you. Sure. And thank you again for sharing. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'd like to do something really quickly out of respect to Sarah and her channel. Um, I think that Aaron is coming up pretty soon. So Sarah, if you want to stop the recording here, I'm sorry, guys, that I'm so long-winded. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll stop it and then um, kind of wrap things up for Aaron because he uses the same channel. So for those of you watching after the fact, this is the power of our story. And this is not the only time this happens. Every time we get together, I look at all the faces I'm seeing. And when they shared their stories, it was very moving and impactful. So make sure that you come back. And uh, when you get the courage up, come join us. It's actually a pretty good group. We don't bite. I'd like to see you here again. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Patrick.